Well, good morning, Riverview family, and a happy new year to all of you. Hope it's been a good start to uh, 2019, and uh, we're of course six days now into the new year. How many of you, by show of hands, have uh, already failed at your New Year's resolutions? Give me a wave if you've already done what you promised yourself you wouldn't do or failed to do what you promised you would. All right, well, I've got good news for you if that's you. Uh, Orthodox New Year starts on the 14th of January. Chinese New Year is on the 5th of February. So you've got at least two more chances, all right, to get those and New Year's resolutions off the launch pad. So just relax and take it easy. You've got plenty of time. Um, I was thinking about my New Year's resolutions this year and thinking about how bad sugar and carbohydrates and lack of regular exercise is for me. And so I decided to give up thinking about it, uh, which is another approach that you might want to take. Certainly makes resolutions a lot more <laughs> achievable. But it's uh, good to be together again on this first Sunday of 2019, and I really do hope and, and pray that 2019 is going to be a great year. I, I trust that you have gotten off to a good start, and if you haven't for any reason, if your start to 2019 has been less than ideal, then I hope that today you uh, feel encouraged and inspired and above all empowered to rise up and respond to whatever it is that life has thrown at you, because whatever it is, I can guarantee you, uh, God was not surprised by it. God God is not intimidated by it. He has a solution for it. He has a way through it. And the truth of the matter is God does some of His finest work in our darkest hours. So whatever situation or circumstance you find yourself in at the start of this year, can I encourage you to be strong, to strengthen your own heart, to encourage your spirit, to build your faith, because God's going to get the last word on that situation and that circumstance. So no matter how you started in this year, you can still finish well and finish strong. Our God has a wonderful ability to turn water into wine, to bring beauty out of ashes, to bring dead things back to life. He can do the most wonderful and remarkable things in the most imperfect and unwanted circumstance. So whatever you have facing, know that we're believing with you and I'm believing with you today that God is going to see you through it and this year is going to be a great year, perhaps the best year of your life. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. All right, now today we're kicking off. Hey, yeah, I reckon that deserved a round of applause. Right. We're kicking off a brand new series today entitled Life by Design. And I really love the idea embedded in this theme title, the idea that we can and should live life with purpose and intentionality, that we need not go through life on some kind of default setting, uh, just assuming that everything is as it should be, that change is not possible or change is not necessary and that fate is gonna determine everything. Uh, in fact, I believe the Bible teaches us very clearly that we ought to go through life deliberately weaving into the very fabric of our everyday living patterns and principles and priorities that reflect the heart of God and uh, align with the will of God and reveal the wisdom of God as revealed in the Word of God. And so today I'm looking forward to sharing some thoughts with you about that subject from out of the Scriptures as we prepare to enter into this new year. And today we're in the Bible's Old Testament book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 30, and there are just two verses I want to share with you today, verse 19 and 20, but two verses that are jam-packed full of life-changing truth. And if we embrace this truth and apply it to our lives, then we certainly will be well positioned in this year to live lives that honor God, bless others, and liberate ourselves. All right, so let's read together Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19 to 20. Follow along on screen or in your Bibles. It says this, Today I have given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and curses. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. You can make this choice by loving the Lord your God, obeying Him and committing yourself firmly to Him. He is the key to your life. Now, before we dive into these verses and explore them together, let me take a moment just to set the scene and, and provide some background to the statement because the context in which the statement is made is really important to understanding its implication for us a little later on. So this is Moses speaking, and he's speaking on behalf of God to the people of Israel who have just been liberated from a life of slavery and oppression in Egypt, and they are now standing at the border of Canaan. Canaan was the land that God had promised to their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as an inheritance. And so having spent 400 plus years in bondage and in slavery, they have now been led by their liberator and leader, a man by the name of Moses, to the border of this promised inheritance. And as they are about to cross over into this land, God wants to give His people instruction and direction 
through his servant Moses. And so he speaks the words we have just read. So that is the scene, that's the setting, that's the context for the statement we have read in Scripture. Now, I remember a number of years ago when my son was much younger, perhaps about seven or eight years of age, he wanted to go see a, a movie, one of these Marvel, Avengers, superhero type movies, which to be honest with you is not my favorite genre of movie, but he was keen, so we went along together. And after the movie, we were driving home in the car and I turned to him and I said to him, so uh, what superpower would you like? If you could choose any superpower in the world, what superpower would it be? Would you like to be fast? Would you like to be strong? Would you like to be able to make yourself invisible? And of course, the prospect of being able to choose a superpower like that absolutely delighted him. So he immediately rattled off a long list of all the superpowers that he would love to have. And he said that he would like to be able to fly and he would like to be as strong as Humongousaur, which is a, a character in the animated Ben 10 series. Some of you parents will know what I'm talking about. Uh, he said he would like to be able to uh, turn himself invisible and he'd like to be uh, strong. And I said to him, well, do you know you already have a superpower? Well, he looked at me with a look of astonishment and surprise and anticipation as though I was just about to reveal some long-held family secret that we were one of those special families, you know, like the Thundermans or the Incredibles, that we had a set of secret superpower abilities. And so I said, do you want to know what it is? He said, yes. I said, well, you, my boy, have the power of choice. You have the power to choose. And it is one of the most powerful powers in the whole world. Well, needless to say, that look of surprise and anticipation very quickly turned to a look of disappointment and annoyance, right? He rolled his eyes and he shook his head and he said, oh, dad. And I think he was thinking to himself, I wish I could make you invisible right now. <laughs> but I, as any good father would do, took the time to elaborate in great detail how wonderful this power of choice really is. And I told him all about how many things he could change through the power of choice, how much of a difference he could make in the world and how he could drive back evil and fight wickedness and save lives and make the world a better place just by employing his power of choice. But I don't think my little fatherly lesson landed. I don't think it stuck because as soon as I was finished, he just changed the subject and moved the conversation back to the movie that we had just seen. But nevertheless, the principle is true. And the idea remains true that you have the power of choice and I have the power of choice and it's one of the most powerful powers in the whole world. And it's arguably one of the greatest gifts that God has given us, the ability to choose and the freedom to choose. Uh, back in the last century, in the 20th century, in the mid-1940s, uh, during the Second World War, there was a really well-known Austrian-born neurologist and psychotherapist by the name of Viktor Frankl. And his name may be familiar to you. And those of you who know his story and journey will know that Victor spent a significant amount of his time during the war uh, imprisoned in a Nazi concentration camp. And during his time there, through his observations of his fellow prisoners and his observation of his own personal experience, he discovered this profound and life-changing truth that ultimately what is most important in life is not what's happening to us or around us, but what's happening inside of us. That what lies before us and what lies behind us are insignificant compared to what lies within us. And more specifically, what is most important are the choices that we make in relation to what is happening around us and to us. And he, uh, post the war, after uh, surviving the Holocaust and, and surviving that experience, uh, developed a new form of psychotherapy called logotherapy. And he wrote a best-selling book called Man's Search for Meaning. And in that book, he said these words. He said, everything can be taken from a man, but one thing, the last of the human freedoms to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. And I love that because it's so true. And I know it's true that there are many things in life we don't get to choose. Like we don't get to choose where we're born or who we're born to. We don't get to choose the color of our skin or the language we first learn. Uh, we don't get to choose whether we're tall or short. We don't get to choose so many things in life. And as Viktor Frankl discovered, very often we find ourselves on the receiving end of other people's choices and other people's decisions. And we have to be the consequence of those choices and decisions. So there are so many things in life we don't get to choose. But that said, there are many things we do get to choose. We always have a power of choice. And the most important things are within the scope of our decision-making ability. The things that matter most in life are the things that we get to choose. And this power of choice is incredibly empowering. In fact, when Jesus was teaching his disciples about kingdom living in his great Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, at some point in that sermon, he turned to his disciples and he said, listen, if you're walking down the road and somebody steals your robe, give them your tunic as well. And if somebody forces you to go one mile, then voluntarily go another. And if somebody strikes you through the cheek, then turn the other cheek to him as well. And at face value, I don't know about you, but I think that's a, a rather unusual thing for Jesus to say. 
But I think that what he was trying to do was to teach us this fundamental truth that in life, you don't always get to choose what happens to you. You don't always get to choose your circumstance or your situation. You don't always get to choose how other people treat you. You don't always get to choose what other people do to you. But nevertheless, you always get to choose. You always have the power of choice. You always have a choice to make. And in any given situation, we've got to stop and ask ourselves, what choice do I have in this situation? What choice can I make? What choice should I make? Because that choice is empowering. You see, when you strike me through the cheek the first time, you do so without my permission. But when I turn the other cheek and I let you strike me again, you do so with my permission and all of a sudden I'm back in control. And that is why Jesus is encouraging us to employ and engage our power of choice in any and any situation, regardless of whether or not the circumstance have been chosen by us, because employing your power of choice is empowering. It empowers you. Now, and I know there are some in certain uh, sociological and, and psychological schools of thought that say, well, we don't really have a power of choice. Humanity has no volitional capacity. We don't really have the freedom to choose. All we're really doing is just living out our programming and our preconditioning by virtue of our nature and nurture. So if you take your genetic makeup and you put it together with all the uh, formative forces that have shaped you culturally, socially, relationally, uh, all the chemical imprinting that's taken place in your brain over the past however many years you've been living, and you put that all together and you put a human being in a certain given situation, you can predict with almost 100% accuracy what decision they're gonna make because all we're doing is living out at a subconscious reactionary level our preconditioning or our programming. Now, don't get me wrong, there is some element of truth to that. We are a product of our environment. We are the product of time and place. The fact that I am a 40-something-year-old Caucasian male living in Perth, Western Australia in the 21st century, raised in a Christian home, raised in an English language speaking environment, raised in apartheid South Africa. All of those things coupled together with my genetic makeup have formed me and made me to some degree. But in addition to that, I am also a self-conscious, self-aware human being. I have the capacity for reflection and for evaluation and for assessment and I can get people to hold up the mirror and help me see things that I could not ordinarily see myself. And not only can I observe them and assess them and evaluate them, but I can respond to them. I can work with them. I can work around them. I can even in some instances change them. So I don't subscribe to this idea that humanity has no volitional capacity, that we don't have the ability to choose, that we can't exercise our will. Of course we can. And part of the reason why I believe we can is because the Bible says we can. Because God commands us to exercise our power of choice. And God would not command us to do something we were not able to do. God would not command us to choose if we were not capable of choosing. God would not ask us to make decisions if we had no volitional capacity. So I do believe that the human being, every human being has the power of choice. And this is the first point that I wanna simply make is that everyone has a God-given ability to choose. Everyone has a God-given ability to choose. And for the nation of Israel standing on the border of Canaan land, about to embark on a new chapter in their story, about to embark on a new season in their journey, having, coming, having come out of captivity into liberty, God wants to speak to His people and say to them, Israel, listen to me closely. Listen to me carefully. I have something very important to tell you. You have the power to choose. And He says it so clearly in Deuteronomy 30 verse 19, today I have given you the choice. And it's a choice between life and death, blessing and cursing, favor and futility. And so to the extent that we embrace that ability to choose to that same degree, we experience God's life and blessing and peace and joy. And so having the capacity to choose is an incredibly powerful, powerful thing. And as we stand on the threshold of this new year, as you stand on the edge of a new chapter in your story and a new season in your journey, God's word to you is the same as it is to me and to the nation of Israel. Today, I am giving you a choice. Today, I have given you the ability to choose. And that ability is an incredibly empowering thing. It's like the old uh, Greek philosopher Anonymous said, choice is the tool that will chisel your character. I love that statement because it's so true, right? It's this capacity for choice that raises the potential for change. Um, I, I studied architecture before I went into ministry and before I studied theology. And as part of our architectural studies, we, we studied the Renaissance period and the art and the architecture and the form uh, within that period. And we studied the life of the illustrious Michelangelo. And during his career and during his lifetime, he produced four statues called the prisoners or the, the slaves. And the one thing that these four statues have in common is that they were all incomplete. 
So the human forms within these sculptures are all still partially embedded in the raw stone in which they were engraved. And many art scholars believe that Michelangelo did this on purpose in order to represent humanity's ongoing struggle to liberate the soul from the carnal self. But Michelangelo was well known for saying that he considered his role as a sculpture to release the forms that he saw in his imagination embedded in the stone. And so he said this famously once, every block of stone has a statue inside and it's the task of the sculpture to uncover it. I love that. And if we carry that analogy forward, you can think about your life as a big block of marble or granite. Yes, life has formed you. Circumstances have shaped you. The elements that make you, you have come together and they've been compressed and compacted, sometimes under great pressure to make you who you are. Yes, to some degree, you're the product of nature and nurture. And yes, to some degree, you're the product of your environment. But that is not all you are. And that is not all you are destined to be. You can change. You can be remolded. You can be remade. You can be refashioned and you can be released. And choice is the tool that will chisel that form. Choice is the tool that will chisel that character. And that's why I like what Dr. Al Bernard said, one of my favorite Christian thinkers and authors and leaders. He said, it is only when you exercise your right to choose that you exercise your power to change. It's only when you exercise your right to choose that you exercise your power to change. That is so true. And so everyone has been given the ability by God to choose. And that's an incredibly empowering thing. Now, as empowering as that is, the ability to choose and the freedom to choose, it is equally annoying and frustrating. And the reason why it is annoying and frustrating is because with every God-given ability comes a corresponding measure of responsibility. You can never have ability without having responsibility, and your responsibility is always equal to the measure of your ability. That's why when you were a baby and you couldn't feed yourself, clothe yourself, burp yourself, or change yourself, your parents did that for you. You had no responsibility for that because you had no corresponding ability, so the responsibility fell to your parents. But the older you got and the greater your ability became, so the measure of your responsibility increased in proportion. So you cannot have ability without responsibility. And for every God-given ability, there's a corresponding measure of responsibility. And with that ability and that responsibility comes accountability. And so that's why it says in verse 19 of Deuteronomy 30, today I've given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and curses. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. That's a poetic way of God saying, I've given you an ability with a corresponding responsibility. And now you have an accountability before God and men for the choices you make. Between heaven and earth, before God and men, there's an accountability for that responsibility. So if we have an ability to exercise choice, we have a responsibility to exercise that choice in a way that aligns with the will of God and the way of God and the wisdom of God as revealed in the Word of God. Now, as empowering as it is, it is frustrating and it is often annoying. And the reason it is because, I don't know about you, but I don't always feel like choosing what is right. I don't always feel like choosing what is good. I don't always feel like choosing forgiveness. I don't always feel like choosing mercy. When somebody has hurt me, wronged me, offended me, disappointed me, or someone I love, I don't always wanna choose selflessness and forgiveness and mercy. Sometimes I just wanna write an angry email. Sometimes I just wanna put some hate speech on Twitter. Sometimes I want to block them on Facebook and punch them in the face in Jesus' name and then ask for forgiveness later. Come on, anybody else feel the same way or am I the only one? Any other human beings in the room? Right, that's how my natural fallen, broken human heart wants to respond. When things are not going my way, when I find myself in situations and circumstances I did not choose, I don't always want to choose the path of selflessness. I don't want to choose the path of sacrifice. Sometimes I just want to wallow in my self-pity. Sometimes I just want to be angry. Sometimes I want revenge. Sometimes I want restitution. And so very often we find ourselves in conflict or in situations of adversity and difficulty that we have not necessarily chosen. But nevertheless, in every one of those situations, we have a choice. And not only do we have the ability to choose, but we have the responsibility to choose in those situations in a way that aligns with the will of God and the way of God and the word of God and the wisdom of God. And it's when we align our choices with what God has revealed to be His will and His way, 
that we experience his life, his blessing, his peace, his joy, and his favor upon our lives. In that split second, in that moment of response, I can make a decision to choose life or death, to choose blessing or cursing, to choose forgiveness or to choose revenge, to choose mercy or to choose judgment. In that moment, I can choose. And depending on how I choose, I experience the life or the blessing or the favor and the goodness of God. I love what Ed Cole said. He said, the only freedom in life we have is the freedom to choose. And then we are bound by our choices. And this is precisely why the ability to choose comes with such a great responsibility to choose is because the choices we make have such far-reaching consequences, both good and bad. And this is the third point I want to make, is that not only does everyone have an ability to choose and a responsibility to choose, but everyone's choices have multi-generational impact. Did you notice what it said in the latter part of verse 20 in Deuteronomy 30? Let's read our passage again. It says, Today I've given you the choice between life and death, between blessing and curses. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. He goes on to say, Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants may live. Do you notice that God is saying there that the choice you make not only impacts your life, but it'll impact the lives of your children and your children's children and their children's children for generations to come? The choices we make in this life have a ripple effect of consequence that roll down the generations. And consequently, we can make choices and decisions that will result in God's blessing and life and favor come to the lives not only of those we lead and live with right now, but those who will outlive us and outlast us. And I know that to be true, not only because the Bible says so, but because I've lived it and experienced it, right? My parents are devout followers of Jesus and have been from as young as I can remember. My grandparents on my mother's side of the family were uh, missionaries from Scotland. Any Scottish people in the room tonight, right? I can't do it, Captain. I don't have the power, right? That's my Scottish accent. Pretty good, isn't it? All right. Stop distracting me. Okay. Moved from Scotland to Africa to plant churches and to preach the gospel, a missionary family. And so I was raised in a household that was filled with faith and filled with the love of God. And it's from as young as I can remember, I was introduced to the truth of God. And so when I came of age, when I developed the ability to make choices and decisions for myself, it wasn't hard for me to say yes to God's love and yes to God's call on my life because I'd spent a lifetime experiencing God's love and experiencing His blessing and experiencing His favor Not because of the decisions I made, but because of the decisions my parents made and because of the decisions my grandparents made. And I'm under no illusions that today I am reaping where I did not sow. I am enjoying the fruit of their labor. I'm enjoying the benefits and the blessings that came with decisions they made generations before I even entered the world. And friends, you might be sitting there thinking to yourself, yeah, that's great and that's wonderful, but I didn't have a history like that. My parents just left me bills. (laughs) Maybe you jumped onto Ancestry.com and had a look at your heritage and found out all your, all your ancestors are all criminals and gangsters. But you know what? You can be the first. You can be the first. You can be the first of a new generation, the first of a new direction, the first of a new trajectory. You can make decisions and choices today that change the course of your family's history forever. If you will choose in a way that aligns with the wisdom and the will and the word and the way of God. And what I love so much about uh, the statement that we're reading together is that God is so clear and unambiguous in it and about it, right? He doesn't mince words. He's not mysterious or unclear. Listen to what it says. We'll read it together again. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. He says, you can make this choice by loving the Lord your God, by obeying Him and committing yourself firmly to Him. Some translations say by clinging to Him. He is the key to your life. God is saying, I'm giving you the power and the freedom and the responsibility to choose. And you can choose life and you can choose blessing and you can choose favor and you can choose the course and the direction and the ultimate destination of your life if you choose me. If you choose to love me, if you choose to serve me, if you choose to obey me, if you choose to depend on me, if you choose to surrender me to me. You see, I've, I've heard so many people say they want to experience the life of God and the blessing of God and the favor of God and the peace of God and the joy of God. And that's great. But people don't want to make decisions that align with His will. And they don't want to make choices that align with His values and with His virtues and with His wisdom. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and life more abundantly. He does want you to experience life, but that life has to be chosen. The life is in the choosing. And so when we choose God and we choose God's will and we choose God's way and we choose God's wisdom and we choose God's word as the source for our lives and we choose His wisdom over our wisdom and His way over our way and we align our lives in obedience to Him, 
we begin to enjoy in ever-increasing measure the blessing and the favor and the peace and the joy and the life of God, the very life of God. But friends, it is in the choosing. And you might be sitting there this morning and you're saying to yourself, you know what, Tim, that's fantastic. But you know, I have so many bad decisions on my record. I've spent the last 20, 30, 40 years of my life making bad choices. And that may be true. You might be living today with the consequence of some of those choices. You may have said some things or done some things to people you love that you regret. And you may still be living with the consequence of that choice today. But you know what I love about this passage of Scripture we read today? The very first word, the very first word in this portion of Scripture is the word today. 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 And you know what I've discovered? I've discovered that sometimes we spend so much time agonizing over the past and worrying about the future that we forget all we really have is today. Right here, right now, the present, this moment is all we have. Think about it. In just two days' time, tomorrow will be yesterday. All we really have is today. And today is the first day of the rest of your life. Today is the day of your salvation. Today, the writer of the Hebrew said, if you hear His voice, do not harden your heart. Today is the day that you can begin to, maybe for the first time in your life, make choices and decisions that align with God's will and His wisdom and His way and open up your life to the possibility of God's blessing and favor and protection and prosperity and leadership and guidance and peace and joy today. Your past does not need to be the determinant of your future. Today, you can chart a new course. You can set a new direction. You can begin anew today, today, if you will hear His voice. And so today, God says, I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Today, I have given you the choice. And I call heaven and earth to witness against you the choice that you make. And friends, if at the start of this new year, you will make a deep commitment in your heart to love God, to obey God, to serve God, to follow God, and above all, to align the choices and decisions you make with God, then I know that this year is going to be a year full of life and blessing and favor and progress for you. And I want to ask you a question, and I want you to carry this question into your week, into your Monday, your Tuesday, your Wednesday. I want you to think about it, pray about it, talk to those you love about it. And the question is this, are my choices right now in life, are my choices aligning with what I know to be The wisdom, the will, and the way of God as revealed in His Word. And when I say your choices, I mean the choices that you're making about the way you spend your time and your money, the way you engage with the world in and with your body, uh, the way you treat your spouse, the way you raise your children, the way you conduct your business, are the choices that you are making in relation to those things aligned with and an expression of what you know to be the will and the way of God as revealed in His Word. And if not, what can you do? to align those choices and those decisions better with God's will and God's way. Because friends, that will open up the windows of heaven over your life and open up the doors to God's favor and blessing on your life in this new year. In Jesus' name, can you say amen? Amen.